Thanks for taking time to attend our session. Uh, we would uh, definitely be able to honor you with a master's degree in troubleshooting NFV issues at the end of this session. It's going to be a crash course. So my name is Sadiq. I'm working, for, working as a senior, technic, a senior cloud success architect for Red Hat, um, uh, focusing on cloud and OpenStack with, with, with targeting NFV as a primary, primary troubleshooting area. And this is my colleague, uh, Jason. Hi, my name is Jason. I work as a senior technical support engineer in Red Hat. I work in OpenStack team. I work with integration of OpenStack with other products. And um, for some time, I've been working on Triple O and NFE use cases with OpenStack. So let me first uh, explore a brief uh, agenda to understand how the presentation is organized. We will first uh, explore uh, the high-level architecture of the NFV. And uh, we will then uh, deep dive into, into exploring the challenges with uh, troubleshooting NFV issues. Then with some examples uh, related with AVNF crash due to kennel panic. And Jason will take you over through a series of uh, issues that he had faced with the OVS DPDK, uh, I mean non-working OVS DPDK and uh, performance issues related with uh, OVS DPDK and what are the, some of the troubleshooting methodologies that you need to apply to overcome these challenges. So uh, let's get into the basic NFV architecture. So um, uh, as you all know, OpenStack is an operating system for cloud infrastructure as a service. And uh, NFV stands for Network Function Virtualization. Originally, OpenStack was in developed uh, with uh, uh, OpenStack was developed for uh, to cater the requirements of private cloud and public cloud for enterprises and service providers. But it was the the initial de de development of OpenStack was in to satisfy or meet the NFV use cases. Later on, we had to adapt OpenStack to meet or cater the NFV requirements. So for this, we had to to develop or to had to introduce a lot of changes within the OpenStack and outside of OpenStack when it comes to, to integrating OpenStack with other, other uh, components within the NFV. As you know, OpenStack alone cannot deliver NFV. OpenStack is just one piece, one piece in, the, in, the, uh, in the puzzle. So uh, let's try to just uh, explore the basic architecture of the NFV. We have OSS, BSS, and we do have uh, EMS for, for that, that's connected to the VNFs. And uh, we do have uh, uh, VNFs. And we do have a lot of vendors who, who build and uh, deliver different use cases for the N VNFs. And uh, most importantly, we do have uh, the NFVI platform. And NFVI stands for Network Function Virtualization Infrastructure. And OpenStack is going to be the primary component that is going to power the NFVI in this architecture. And we do have uh, Mano, that is uh, management and uh, that handles the management and orchestration for the whole NFV, NFV architecture. So uh, from this, this uh, diagram itself, you, you will be able to uh, understand how challenging a troubleshooting going to be within the, open, with, within the NFV architecture. Because there should be, in a lot of cases, there should be a lot of gray area who is wrong, who is doing things in the wrong way. The symptoms may point that there is something wrong with the NFVI open stack, but the problem may be somewhere else in the, within the VNF or in, within the way it was orchestrated. So, so the intention of this session, as I explained earlier, to help you to, to understand where to focus when it comes to troubleshooting an NFV issue. So uh, let's, uh, let me just try to explore what is the fundamental challenge with the NFV. As I explained, we have OSS, BSS, NFVI, and MANO, and VNFs. And in most of the cases, all these components are developed by different vendors in the market. And we are going to stitch all these together to, to deliver uh, NFV architecture for a telco. So um, the basic challenge is all these vendors have different level of support and different level of technical support people who are working on, on, on these issues. And if there is a coordination between these people, when a telco is hitting a problem, then the problem will go nowhere. So 
again to exacerbate to, to, to make the this this makes it very complex when we try to split down when we try to split each component further further deep. So that means you use NFV OpenStack as an NFVI and NFVI maybe the OpenStack is given by Red Hat or any other vendor. And if you try to, to, to go deep into the NFVI, there should be dependency on other vendors. You may be using a different storage vendor. You may be using a different uh, SDN vendor. And you may be using a different uh, vendor to, to compute uh, services. And a lot of other add-on services are integrated into, the, into, into create the NFVI. So this means you further need to work with uh, different, uh, different vendors to troubleshoot an issue. So this makes makes the NFV very, very complex to troubleshoot. But what we have to do to ideally achieve, you, I mean, it's, it's, we need to bring all the players into a single, single table to, to, to basically efficiently troubleshoot an NFVI issue. I, I'm, I'm not uh, trying to say a physical table, but virtually the, everyone should be around the table to, to troubleshoot an NFV issue efficiently. So um, let, let me just give you an example. So how we, we applied this methodology to, in, in, one of, in one issue that we hit uh, during, uh, while deploying a VNF, on, while onboarding a VNF for a telco environment. So the problem uh, that uh, I'm trying to explain is uh, Red Hat uh, OpenStack was used as an NFVI, and, uh, uh, and, and the telco used a different vendor to, uh, to VNFs from a, dif a different vendor to, to, on top of OpenStack. So um, uh, basically the problem was that there is a compute node one and compute node two, and one VNF is running on compute node one, and another VNF is going to, uh, going to run on compute node two, and they can run fine, they can spawn the instances, orchestrate the instances without any issues, but whenever the VNFs uh, start transmitting data packets, at some point, one of the VNFs Kernel panics, and it crashes. So um, this means the, uh, there is no pattern. It's pretty random. So um, uh, we, you cannot say after five minutes or something like that, it crashes. No, nothing like that. It may be one hour or two hour. After two hour, you keep transmitting data packets between the VNF. And uh, this is reliably reproducible. So because you just need to, to transmit the packets. At some point, it will crash. And we got the kernel panic message uh, from the VNF, and we also, we also got a VM core from the, from the VNF. From Red Hat point of view, Red Hat is unable to, to, to analyze the VM core because it's, it's using an operating system that people in Red Hat cannot, uh, cannot, uh, no, do not know the code for that. So, so ideally, um, so the VNF is going to crash on either of the compute nodes. It, it doesn't matter on which one. And, uh, so uh, we, ideally, the, the VNF vendor uh, communicated that they have tested this VNF in their internal and OpenStack environment multiple times. For multiple days, they have uh, kept it uh, transmitting packets, but they never hit this kernel panic. So on the other hand, uh, the, the, uh, the NFVI infrastructure vendor, they say the VNF is, going to, is crashing. So you need to analyze the VM core and tell us if there is anything wrong with the NFVI that we need to change. Okay, so if we work this way, then it, definitely this is going to be a big problem and we will not find out a solution for this. At this point, we need to have a, a collaboration between the VNF vendor and the OpenStack vendor to efficiently troubleshoot this. And we managed to do this and uh, at the uh, and VNF vendor, they, they try to analyze the VM core and on the Red Hat side, we try to analyze the, the, what is wrong with the OpenStack environment. And we got the first symptom. We got the, f the first symptom from the VNF vendor, and they are saying that the VNF, uh, the VNF is, both VNF is configured with a 50, uh, 1500 uh, MTU. MTU of, uh, of the target destination VNF is also 1500. But whenever a packet arrives on the VNF, the packet is getting defragmented because what, whatever arrives here is a NANK packet, a jumbo frame packet. So uh, we were wondering if this send a 1.5K packet and the packet arrives here as a NANK packet, 
and during the defragmentation, the, the operating system cannot uh, handle the defragmentation of too many packets, that it crashes due to a bug. So this uh, actually helped us to deep dive into, uh, into how the packet is being transmitted from one VNF to another VNF within the open stack, and where is it actually get the packet getting changed into, the, into an NK MTU. So to achieve this, we, we ran a TCP dump on, on all the in intermittent interfaces to see where the packet, the, the original it started with 1.5K MTU, where it getting changed into a NK MTU. And we found that within this flow, either on, on the tap interface, either of the tap interface, the packet is getting from changed into NAND K MTU. So this actually led us to explore further and understand and, and, and investigate why the packet might be getting uh, uh, assembled here to, to an NK MTU. Though originally it, it started uh, it started uh, for, with a 1.5 K MTU, and uh, we, we 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 found that the OpenStack is configured for 9000 MTU, and the VNF is configured for 1.5K MTU. And uh, due to the security groups, being, being security ru group rules being applied on the TAP interface, and the way the IP tables works is that uh, to apply the IP tables rules on a packet, it would assemble the packet to the maximum possible um, uh, data packet size before it, it applies the IP tables rules on top of that. And because this is an NK, this has an NK MTU, and to apply the security group rules, the packet is reassembled again into an NK, and after that it is never fragmented, and it goes directly into the VNF. Because the VNF cannot handle the jumbo frames, it again needs to be defragmented. So you, you would originally, th you would really think that, oh, this is very easy to troubleshoot, right? Change the MT of the VNF to 9000. It's very simple, right? Why don't you just change the MT of, of, of the VNF to 9000 to resolve this problem? But that is a problem because the VNF is not built to support 9K jumbo frames MTU. So uh, we cannot change, change uh, the MTU of, of a VNF to 9K. Uh, uh, that's not a solution. Then you would. Uh, Thing. Why don't you change the MTU of OpenStack into into 1.5K to 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 to, to, be, to match to sync with the MTU of of the VNF? It's very easy, right? But no, because the problem is that OpenStack does not support changing the MTU per port. We need to change the MTU of the entire OpenStack deployment. That means the same environment is expected to to cater, the, cater a lot of other VNFs, which is going to get a huge network performance benefit by using the NAND-K MTU. So by changing the, the whole open stack into 1.5K MTU, so we are actually killing the performance of all other VNFs. So it's not a solution either here. The other important, important thing that we could explore as a solution is enable port security. So port security is basically a feature within the latest OpenStack to actually uh, uh, disable security groups per port. So that means uh, you, may, you may guess, why don't we just uh, disable the port security so that, uh, uh, so that uh, uh, there, should be, there, sh there will not be any, any IP tables rules, so the packet will not be reassembled at the tab interface to 9K. It's a, it's a right guess, but this is not true. Because with port security, we are not bypassing the IP tables layer. We are only bypassing the IP tables rules. So there should not be any rule within the IP tables layer, but there should be a single rule that is accept everything. So to apply that single rule, the IP tables kernel will again reassemble the packets. So this is not a solution either. So the, another solution that we explored, the VNFs, none of the VNF in this environment uh, requires security groups. So why don't we just uh, uh, set uh, bridge NF call IP tables to zero 
so that the IP tables will be completely disabled on that specific compute node. So this is an acceptable solution, but uh, so but the, the 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 problem with this is that we cannot onboard any other VNF which may need, require IP table support or security group support. So we explored uh, this option and we originally implemented this option and uh, uh, we then again explored further options. So uh, from the VNF vendor side, they did uh, further research and they inspected uh, what can be changed on the VNF to, to support this. And through, from their investigation, they found that the, the VNF was using, was configured to use an E1000 emulation. And if we change this, uh, this NIC card into a word, to, to use word IO, so then they see, they see that it improves the performance and it again prevents the crash. So why? Because the crash happened because of a bug within the E1000 emulation that, use, uh, that is uh, within the E1000 driver that is being used uh, within, the, within the VNF. So it gave them two benefits, either uh, uh, change the I mean, performance improvements, then also a solution for, for implementing uh, the, I mean, to prevent the crash. So is this the ideal solution? Of course, no, because the packet still gets reassembled and defragmented. It's going to affect the performance. So ideal perf ideally, uh, we should, the, the ideal solution for this problem is OpenStack should uh, support per port MTU, or at least per network MTU at a minimum, so that we can specify that the port that the VNF is connected should have a 1.5K MTU, and all other ports within that network and environment can use jumbo frames or 9K MTU. So with this, so uh, we have uh, created a bug, upstream bug for this, and we have internally also uh, recommended that to, to, to efficiently support and to efficiently make the VNF working within this environment. With, with, for telcos, we must support uh, uh, 1.5K MTU and per port MTU within the open stack. So as I, as I explained earlier, we didn't apply any of the solutions that I explained earlier because they are not, they have its own side effects. It's not fit as a right solution for this problem. Then we came back into, into the two last solutions. And within this, uh, this is something op need to be developed within the open stack, so we cannot uh, we implement this right now. But, and we finally decided to, to implement this, this solution. So that's all from my side. So uh, I, what I want to highlight here is it was a great collaboration between the open stack because there was nothing wrong with the BSS and OSS and the MANO orchestration layer here because the orchestration was completely successful. Uh, the problems have started uh, after the orchestration. So we, cannot, we can rule out the possibility of the ISS, BSS, or other manual layers causing this problem. And we, we, we came down into the, into the two options. Either the problem is with VNF, and, or the problem is with the NFVI infrastructure. And as you know, since we collaborated, we were able to find out a solution from the VNF point of view, and from the OpenStack point of view to solve this problem. So this is more important. If we collaborate, we can get a solution. So, and uh, it's, it's very critical to collaborate more effectively within the, to troubleshoot NFV issues. With this, I will hand over to Jason to, to walk us through some of the issues that, that, that he, ha he has been working. Okay, thanks Sadiq. So uh, what I'm going to talk today is OVS DPDK troubleshooting. So uh, what I want to present to you is the method methodology we use to troubleshoot OVS DPDK. So OVS DPDK is a very important um, and very interesting technology. Why? Because you can use any hardware um, and uh, a NIC that supports DPDK, and you can have fast packet forwarding using this DPDK libraries, which we are using in OVS. So, um, Although it is very interesting and it's very beneficial, people who have deployed an environment with DPDK would have known there are a lot of challenges around it. The challenges uh, mainly come because it, DPDK, OBS DPDK integration requires uh, an understanding of the hardware, um, 
some configuration on Linux system and some configuration on OBS. Something goes wrong, then uh, it may not work well. So before I go to the methodology and then to a scenario where I explain a scenario where we troubleshoot DPDK. So let me tell what you're looking at. So you have a compute node which is Linux system. In my case, we usually use Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, version 7. You have some um, CPU cores which is isolated and tuned for this uh, PMD workload. You have a NIC device, uh, NIC card which is supported by DPEK, which will be associated with VFIO PCI driver. And you will have huge pages configured for your instance and OBS, how much of that is required. You will have open vSwitch version 2.6 or 2.5, whichever, whichever, whichever has DPDK, it's fine. You have configured open vSwitch with one NIC card. You have enabled huge pages per socket or however you want to configure it. You have already decided the course you want for pole mode driver thread because you, ne you need to assign some course for DPDK. And you also need to know the number of memory channels which will call configure in open vSwitch. So this is a, a classic example of your environment, you have a VM with Vortio emulation. Uh, via libvirt, it, it acts as a, a vhost user um, socket, which your OVS DPDK or your poll mode dri uh, driver thread will poll and get information, and it will uh, also communicate with your actual card, and it will make, make things work. So, so I have uh, usually come across two types of issues when troubleshooting OVS DPDK. One is OVS DPDK does not work at all. You spawn an instance and um, it does not, you cannot ping it, you cannot ping outside, you cannot ping inside, nothing works. Okay, other scenario is when you get things, something to work, you can ping outside, you can ping inside, but it does not match the performance you are expecting. So it's like a fast data, uh, so fast packet forwarding, right? So you would expect it to be much better and you may just find maybe like 30, 40%. That's a big difference, 30%, uh, 30 40% um, of what you expect. It's a big degradation, right? So, so these are two types of uh, performance is uh, sorry, issues that I face with uh, OVS, and I want to explain what are the normal methodologies I develop to fix the issue fast. The fixing the issue fast is a most critical thing for us. So there are two things that I do first, so, so that I can fix the issue in probably five minutes. Just run OS VSCTL show command. What, what will I look like? I look at, um, the output, does it look as it is expected? I expect a DPDK bridge, a NetDev bridge. I expect, I expect a DPDK port under it. Um, everything looks fine, there are no errors seen. That's what I expect in OVS VSCTL show output. The next, uh, next step is, if at all, that output does not give enough information. Looking at the vSwitchD process uh, log is also very important. So the main thing that gives you this benefit is this open vSwitch process use DPDK library. So when open vSwitch process starts, that is OVS hyphen vSwitch D process starts, it starts, it, it initializes all resource required for DPDK. That is, it, it starts the uh, PMD threads. It, it detects the NUMA infra, uh, architecture of your, of your compute node. Um, it uh, spawns a Paul mode driver threads on the right course. The Paul mod driver threads access the huge pages that is configured in your system. It creates, uh, you already have a, a NetDev bridge uh, for DPDK. It will create a DPDK port. It will detect the NIC which you have assigned for DPDK and add the DPDK port inside the NetDev bridge. So all these information you can see just in this log file. So it's, so it's a very important log file. Uh, it's a var log open vSwitch open vSwitch D. Oh, sorry, obvious hyphen v switch dot log. So the next step, what I do, is to check configuration of open v switch and check the hardware. Does it match? So there are multiple things inside this that needs to match. It's, it's supposed to be NUMA aware. You need to have core that is optimum for use of OVS DPDK. The next point, so just by con Checking the configuration you have for Open vSwitch D, uh, Open vSwitch DPDK, and the hardware you have is not enough, because your understanding of the hardware may be wrong. So you you would probably set something in OVS DPDK, and it's trying to accomplish that, trying to assign those resources. If there's something wrong about it, it'll just fail. So 
you need a tool or you need a set of commands which will give you real-time information of what's happening in your Linux system, what's happening to your pole mod driver. Is it able to start the right way? It is able to use a course that you want it to. So all these informations are important. I will not list out all the commands required. There, there are a lot of open vSwitch related commands which you can use to check the output of uh, like the NetDev um, uh, data path uh, is, is there or not, or the, the DPD port is not there or not. There are a lot of commands. But I, I want to just give you an example, some, some of the important commands which I used to get information from the Linux, Linux system itself is driver CTL to list all the dri PCI devices and the driver associated with them. So DPDK use VFIO PCI driver, so I can make sure that the driver I want to use is actually associated with VFIO PCI rather than the kernel driver. The second command is also very interesting. I use ps command to list all the threads on the system. So open vSwitch deep process starts the pole mode drivers as p threads. And um, so if you do ps hyphen el, capital S for thread, and uh, you can see uh, under OVS, you will find a PMD something. 54 or 55 or something based on the PID. These are the process, uh, the threads, PMD uh, threads. So you, you can see the threads that are running. You will notice that they have 100% CPU utilization because it keeps on pulling um, on the core. Uh, you, on, the, on that, it, it keeps on pulling the socket and uh, the NIC. So you will find the uh, CPU utilization is 100%. You get the TID, the thread ID, and you can check inside your proc file system the NUMA map for that process. So ideally in slash proc, um, you don't see thread ID, you only see process ID. But although it does not show a directory, you can still put the thread ID and you can check the NUMA map and you will find uh, which all uh, huge pages this Palmo driver thread is using. It's a very interesting command. I, I will show you this later. Um, others to check the huge pages assigned in each of the um, NUMA node. So you may have 12, uh, 12 huge pages of 11 GB. But you can assign all the 12 on one NUMA node. Another NUMA node can have zero also. So this is a very important command. And the last is um, you can also run a packet capture. Packet capture, as you know, that in DPD, uh, OVS DPDK, you cannot use TCP dump uh, because it's not uh, it's, it's a user space uh, process. PMD is a user space process to capture that. You cannot use TCP dump. You can use a tool provided by DPDK, uh, DPDK pdump, uh, which you can compile and use it. So the next set of issues, uh, the next set of kind of issues I've seen is performance troubleshooting. So this makes it a little more tough because you got everything to work. So a simple log file does not, uh, may not always help. So you have to understand the scenario. So what's first thing is to understand the scenario. What uh, was the test about? Is is it what is the source and destination? Are they both VNF running on a compute node with both DPDK running? How are you testing it? Which tool are you going to use to test, test it? What is the packet size you're using? And how much you're getting? So all these uh, gives you a good understanding. And plus the network devices in between them, that gives you a good understanding of what you're exactly trying to do. And then you can come to uh, what is the expected performance for the hardware? And plus the percentage degradation. Percentage degradation does not give much I mean, it does not give you a quick hint of anything, but you will just know that the uh, that how serious is the issue. I mean, is, is a big difference or small? And so, at some point, it will give you a good clue of what could be the issue. Next is the OVS configuration complements the hardware. So um, it's it's not that the OVS configuration is wrong and DPDK does not OVS DPDK does not does not work at all. There are scenarios where you can do the configuration wrong and it will give you bad performance. For example. Uh, memory. So mem you configure open vSwitch with memory channels. So these memory channels are something on your motherboard. Um, each NUMA node has some memory channels on which your, uh, your uh, memory sticks are on. So what happens is when OVS um, as assigns huge pages, it is, uh, it is good, it gives you good performance if OVS can set these huge pages at it's a huge page is conti contiguous uh, space. So if you can assign this huge pages at the start of every um, memory channel, it, when OVS um, PMD thread starts, it can associate the objects 
at the start of this, which gives best performance. So if you give a wrong memory channel, it will not work well. Your motherboard can have a riser sort slot. If, if your vendors build your uh, server, probably they already know, and they've kept your um, NIC card on the best um, um, PCI slot. But it's good to look at your motherboard um, uh, data sheet to understand if there's any other um, any riser slot, and you're not using this slot or a better performing slot on your motherboard. You can enable hyper-threading cores. Um, so what what uh, what you can do is enable hyper-threading and make the polymer driver. Uh, threads use the sibling cores. So advantage is this Polymer drivers uh, maintains a cache for each core. So uh, as much cores, that much better. So, so you can also set optimum receive queue. So you have an option to set uh, receive queue for DPDK physical port. So, so next is you can um, you can have the have the cores on which the Polymer driver runs okay tuned. To this, uh, to this uh, uh, workload, because this is a special, special kind of workload where the PMD thread um, takes 100% of your uh, CPU cycle. And um, you will need to isolate it to make sure no other processes run on it. So what I do is I use a tool called TuneD, uh, and then there's a profile called CPU partitioning. So what it does is it, it um, adds uh, an option inside, inside the kernel, which makes sure that uh, there are no CPU ticks uh, in, on this core. So um, that is if in case the pro processor or the core has only one process. If there, there are multiple processes, this does not work. So, so it's necessary that it has to be isolated. It has to have this uh, no HZ full and the cores which you're going to use for Polymer driver. It, it gives good performance. There are a lot of things that you can look at. Um, Avoid mixing kernel data path and NetDev data path on your compute node. If, you're, if you have made something like that, your packets can take uh, both paths and can give you low performance. You also have BIOS recommendations from DPDK developers, uh, which is also there inside um, the Open vSwitch guide, which I will mention it later. So you, you will need to apply those BIOS optimizations to make sure your core uh, uh, the CPU or the cores run with maximum benefit of uh, your um, system for the pole mode driver to work uh, pretty quickly. So the next is a little more interesting uh, point to understand um, which cache hits f uh, a lot. So in, in your OBS DPDK, um, for you to get the best performance, you need to, your traffic needs to get all the flows resolved in, in EMC cache, that is exact match cache. This, this is a cache that is maintained by the Polman dri drivers. It's, it's, a, it's a part of OVS DPDK. And um, if, your, if your traffic uh, frequently hits this EMC uh, cache, you will get best performance. But if at all, so the EMC, EMC cache has something called as a hash, and there's an algorithm to fetch the flows from the hash. Um, the size of EMC cache, everything is pre-compiled uh, when you compile the OVS with DPDK libraries. So if, if EMC cache misses, then you go to the mega flow, um, which is also something in OVS in memory. If that also misses, so there is a, a considerable penalty or uh, degradation of perfor performance in mega flow. But if mega flow also fails to resolve the flow, it will go to open flow from open vSwitch, which gives a very uh, bad performance as equal to using ML2 OVS by itself. It is also very important for, uh, for an individual to understand what is the next version of OVS and what version of OVS you're using. Because um, there are features coming in one by one. And there, have be, there has been a lot of active uh, community contributions of suggestions and code to improve the performance of uh, communication via OVS DPDK. For example, in OVS 2.5 and 2.6 itself, there are a lot of difference like MTU or having multiple queue or, or so on. So um, having a good understanding of which version of Open vSwitch you're using, what are the drawbacks of that version, and what is the advantage of next version, next version would be good. Uh, profiling is the last, uh, last pointer I have. Uh, profiling is something you only go to when you get the issue. 
otherwise you cannot simply profile a component because unless you are sure this component or there's a polymer drive polymer driver thread is not functioning at its maximum or there's some kind of saturation so that then only you can get something out of um, uh, profiling or else you're just getting a lot of data without any uh, strong um, hint of this is the root cause so let me come to OVS DPDK failures. So this is the scenario which I told first that it does not work at all. Okay, so uh, so this is the symptom. It does not work at all, and this is the architecture. It's, it's a common generic architecture. You have a NUMA uh, hardware. There's two NUMA nodes. There are some set of cores. There are some set of uh, memory sticks on each core, and there's a NIC which is in NUMA node one, which I'm planning to use. So I'll, I, I will talk about two scenarios in this um, um, OVS DPDK failures. So first issue is um, it does not work. That, that is a, that's the issue. It does not work at all. I start the instance, ping does not work, nothing works. So first thing I, I do is I took, took a look at OVS VSC to show output. And I see everything is almost as it's supposed to be. There is a, a, a BR link zero, which is my net dev uh, bridge, and there is a DPDK port. Although DPDK port, there has been some error in creation. So it says, cannot create PMD threads out of, uh, due to out of unpinned cores on NUMA node zero. So, uh, so I, I could probably look at the next step, that is look at the uh, open vSwitch log, and I found the same error. I could not find anything more. So just by looking at it, um, I would probably guess that Open vSwitch was trying to start the power mode driver, and something went wrong when it tried to start a, a power mode uh, driver thread on uh, NUMA node zero. So next, uh, so where is the OVS trying to start the uh, the power mode driver threads, PMD threads? Okay. So I, I had a look at the OVS uh, Open vSwitch database. There's a, a column or other config. And I look at look look at the mask. It's 28. 28 is a hexadecimal value. I'll just convert it to binary. So this is uh, CPU uh, used CPU mask starting from right to left, which is from zero to nth CPU core. So in in this case, zero 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 one zero one. That means it started zero sec first, second, third, fourth. So second and fourth core is is the one which open vSwitch is supposed to use as per my configuration. I'll just have a quick look at the NUMA topology. There, there are a lot of commands. There are two, three commands which you can see the NUMA, NUMA topology. I usually use this NUMA CTL. So a quick look says uh, core two and core four is on node zero. So what about node zero? Why is it not able to start on node, node zero? But DPDK port NIC and R, port and NIC are on node one. So I can just use that OVS VSC to show, um, so OVS VSC to list interface, and I can just say check the status, and you will get a lot of information in the status. I just want to concentrate on the NUMA node over here, and says NUMA node one. So you would probably say, so what? So, so what is uh, our issue here was that we were using OVS 2.5. So in OVS 2.5, the uh, the code forces a pole mode driver to be in, in the same NUMA node as the NIC port. You will know, know you might have read somewhere that OVS 2.6 is NUMA aware. So you, you do not have this feature. So that, that's why it failed to start the pole mode driver. So, uh, so this is what it was um, for OVS 2.5. What we did is we just moved the pole mode driver to no, uh, node 1. So how did we do that? Um, we we uh, we just went to the same database and set a hexadecimal value to use three and five um, cores inside uh, cores inside this um, other config PMD hyphen CPU hyphen mask, and we were able to fix the issue. Similarly, um, another one issue um, where OVS DPD did not work at all. So for, first thing for me was to just look at OVS VSC to show output, see what's going on. Just like before, everything is fine except the DPDK port seems to have some error while creating. And this looks something more similar, it's saying, saying cannot allocate memory, which looks very simple. Saying um, So if I were to guess, I would say 
it tried to start the pole mode driver thread and it could not allocate memory. Why is that? So, what exactly gives this information about uh, which, uh, which memory to use? So, I am using huge pages and huge pages we mention which socket, how much memory we have in OBS uh, DPDK. So, I, I, I just had a look at the log, OBS uh, VSWD log. Uh, the output is little more uh, than what I saw in previous output. Here when the OVS vSwitchD process started, it tried to start the PMD thread and it crashed. Segmentation fault, it gives some more ideas, right? Segmentation fault means it's not able to access the uh, memory segment it wants and crashed. And later it comes to the same error which we see in OVS VTL CTL short put. Something around socket one, possibly, right? So, uh, what next? Just let, let's look at which, um, which NUMA node it uses. Uh, OVS uh, DPDK uses a NIC card which is in NUMA node 1. And um, the next output shows, looks like um, the socket, uh, sorry, the NUMA uh, had 8 GB of huge pages, sorry, the OVS DPDK had 8 GB of huge pages on node, one, uh, node 0 and 4 GB of huge page on node 1, which is no reason to crash anyway. So, so you have some huge page, right? So it, sh it should still start the pole mode driver. So, so OBI is trying to start, it knows how much it needs to allocate, but does Linux provide that huge pages or not? So, so before you go that, so by default, Linux, if you enable huge page on Linux system, it divides the huge page across different NUMA nodes. So if you have um, 16, uh, 16 huge pages of 1, 1 GB and you don't have any other configuration set in sys, uh, sorry, st startup, it will divide that 16 into 8 huge pages on each uh, NUMA node. So when your system comes up, you'll find 8 huge pages on node 0 and 8 huge pages on node 1. So, so you can get that information from uh, sys file system. So I just had a look at the sys file system and I noticed that for nodes uh, 0 and 1 when I checked, so I do find 8 GB for node 0, but 0 for node 1. So th that means the Linux does not have huge pages ready for node 1. So if any application tries to, to, uh, to grab a huge page from node 1, it will fail. So that is the root cause of the issue that this, the system did not have huge page on node 1. So just to fix this, uh, we just enabled uh, echo 4 into the sys file system, so I did not require reboot. So what exactly happened was while testing all these configurations, um, we made a mistake of disable, uh, setting 0 to node 1, uh, no, NUMA node 1, so there was no huge page on that. And we had, we had never rebooted the system to, you know, to test it again. So it always remained at 0, a huge page on, on NUMA node 1. Although I don't need, a, uh, need to reboot it, I just need to directly set huge page as how much ever required by OVS and that fixes the issue. So, uh, so these are the methodologies I use, these are the issues we faced, um, but this is not, uh, it's, it does not cover everything. There are more points to add, there are more suggestions. Um, I've also co come across a question, um, uh, how to um, check if there's a saturation um, or check the CPU caches to you know understand where the performance. So we, I'm still looking at uh, more and more tools to understand what we can do to figure out um, quickly in OBS DPDK to understand where could where there could be a bottleneck um, issue. So for uh, coming across all these steps, I had uh, had gone through um, Open vSwitch DPDK install guide, how to guide the Intel um, articles, the DPDK programming guide to make up all the steps to understand how we can do things better. So um, that, that's all for me. I'll well, let me just uh, conclude this. Like just Jason explained uh, some problem that you, hit, you, hit, you may hit with uh, NFV, maybe deep in, uh, into OpenStack and the networking stack that you can fix alone. But some problems, it may not be clear initially where the problem is actually is. So it's very important that you drive the collaboration with multiple vendors. And let this presentation be a motivation for you to drive that level of collaboration. Thank you very much. If you have so, so if you have any questions, you can come uh, over at the mic and, and ask them. Yes, sure. So, uh, yeah. uh, hi. Uh, my name is Kurpur Singh. Uh, I'm from Spartan Communication, and uh, I have a question. 
regarding uh, measuring latency at the virtual interfaces, right, between the various virtual entities, let's say between the VNS or if you are using OBS TPDK between OBS TPDK and a VNF and things like that, are there any tools out there to measure latency uh, between the virtual entities? Okay. Yeah, uh, I think there are uh, different tools that comes from from uh, different uh, uh, VNF vendors, but I cannot pinpoint you so uh, exactly what uh, general tool that being used. So. Uh, there are a lot of. It all depends on what's your use case for for the latency, and how how much you need to achieve. Right. Uh, so, so if I'm trying to troubleshoot, let's say latency issues, and I want to find out which particular virtual entity, which VNF, or is it the OBS switch or TPD or wherever, the additional latency is getting introduced or service yeah, degradation is happening. Yeah, so, so exactly. So if you want to find out whether there is any latency problem within the open stack layer, you basically need to use a lot of tools, uh, profiling that, uh, profiling tools that Jason recommended. Maybe he can give you more details. And if the latency is, uh, to measure whether the latency is within the VNF layer or, or, or on the, any other layer, you may have to use a, a latency measuring tool d recommended by the VNF vendor. And ultimately, you need to prove where the latency problem is. Yeah. So maybe you want to... The, to, the hard so, part, the so, hard... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So at the first step, maybe um, I, I was I had showed one PMD hyphen uh, uh, show command, DPIF something slash, so right. uh, which in which I showed EMC cache. Uh, right. So it also shows you the <coughs> the, uh, the CPU cycles. So so it shows that uh, polling takes hundred percent. Then there's another one section which processing which says processing cycles, yeah. So maybe at the first point, you can just look at if the processing uh, percentage comes to you know, close to like a hundred or something like that. Okay, so basically you're saying yeah. processing cycles are mm -hmm. coming to the top or threshold. That means that that will introduce additional latency and that might be causing the problem. Yeah. It, yeah. On the OBS side, yeah. basically. Okay, all right, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. I just have two minutes, so. Okay, Thank my you. question is if you did any tuning inside the guests, because uh, in my experience, uh, I activated the multi queue and uh, for the instances, but uh, when you do the performance test, you always uh, yeah you always get it in on the same CPU. My question is if you've done any any tuning inside the instances for the for this uh, project. Yeah, I think multi queue is uh, already available within the KVM. And uh, I think it's still not applied within the OpenStack layer. And uh, I mean, there are still work in progress to, to support multi-queue. And on the other hand, the other tuning that you can do inside the VNF is basically uh, implement uh, DPD inside the VNF as well. So, so that uh, the packet that uh, comes from the hypervisor, by passing the hypervisor kernel, it uh, also bypasses the VNF kernel and directly goes into the user space mode. But this is conditional to, to, uh, on, on the support from the VNF vendor to tune it. So and other tuning is really specific to the, to the VNF. I don't see uh, any general recommendation that I can provide for a, for a, that can be applied for all the VNFs. Because uh, VNFs are having different operating system and different way of handling. It handles different functions from routing DPI into a lot of other functions. There may not be a single tuning parameter that fits every VN, VNF use cases, right? It's, it's going to be specific. So just, just to add to that, the, the multi-queue you mentioned, you'd enable that from the VM, the instance? No, you I, no, I just the DPDK on the on the flavor, on Nova. You can enable it on the flavor. OK. okay. But when you start to, uh, when you start the guest and you start doing uh, performance tests, you always get it on the same CPU in the network. So what I did, I inside the instance, I activated some kernel parameters that spread the load mm -hmm. between all the CPUs. And my okay. question is if this is recommended or not. Uh, and if to spread in the your list? experience, so you also do that. Yeah, multi-queue is definitely recommended to, to, get, to give you the best performance. But uh, there is still work need to be done to, to manage the multi-queue efficiently within the OpenStack layer. It's already there 
within the KVM or the hypervisor layer. So if you, if you use plain libword and KVM, it will work without any issues. But uh, there should be a lot of testing and everything to ma make sure that this is working as expected when you put it on OpenStack. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. So you can catch us uh, anytime if you have more questions. And thanks for listening. Thank you.